Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 48, Apollo Program Flight 10, Apollo 16, Part 1, Gremlins and Gimbals. Last time, we covered the nearly perfect flight of Apollo 15. The ninth flight and fourth lunar landing of the Apollo program delivered on the promise of the J missions right off the bat. With three days on the surface, five EVAs, including one stand-up and one deep space, and 170 pounds of moon rocks, the scientific return of Endeavour and Falcon would pay dividends for years. The mission would eventually gain a nasty asterisk with the postage cover controversy, but I think that at worst that ends up being just an interesting wrinkle in the story. While Apollo 15 ended up being the first of the J missions, that wasn't always the case. With a budgetary cliff looming in the distressingly near future, NASA converted 15 from H to J in order to get the most out of their slick new equipment. The crew had to retool their training, but these guys are pros and handled it with aplomb. Apollo 16, however, was a J mission from the start. It had some lofty goals and some big questions to answer. When you look up at the moon, you see two parts, broadly speaking. A generally light-colored base with dark splotches across its face. The dark splotches are the maria, Latin for seas, and are the remnants of vast cataclysmic impacts. The hits were so big that large chunks of the moon were just completely liquefied, creating enormous lava pools. That's what we see today. In contrast, the light parts are what's left of the original crust of the moon. Since they hadn't been smashed into oblivion by giant impacts, they were physically higher than the Maria and were called the Highlands. The Highlands have been around basically forever, and if you're around basically forever in space, you're going to get the snot kicked out of you by every little and not so little rock that comes drifting by. Plus, whenever something huge hit other parts of the moon creating the Maria, the pieces would land in the Highlands. The upshot of this is a landscape that is a complete mess of craters, boulders, cliffs, and mountains. Really, I guess the Maria were more beat up, but they got so beat up that they just turned into a liquid and started from a clean slate. This is a far cry from the landing sites we've seen thus far. Each landing was a compromise between the engineers, who ideally wanted a big featureless plane, and scientists who wanted, you know, rocks and stuff. Apollo 11 was a win firmly in the engineer column, but each landing had gotten a little more bold. With this fifth landing, the confidence was there that the crew could handle setting down their delicate machine in a ripped and torn landscape covered in boulders. The specific battered landscape was the Descartes Highlands. If you look at the moon, you can see a large white area at the bottom right pushing into the dark maria, almost near the middle of its face. That's roughly where Descartes is. The risk of landing at Descartes was expected to pay off, since this was an area unlike any of the previous landing spots. Both for engineering simplicity and scientific reasons, all the previous landings had been on or near the Maria. The hope was to confirm a hypothesis that these highland regions of the moon were formed by volcanic processes. By having the astronauts grab a wide variety of samples, including from deep craters that had punched through the upper layers, geologists would be able to find out one way or the other. Flying this important scientific mission is a crew we know pretty well. Slotting in as commander is our old friend John Young. We first met Young way back in episode 13, when he flew the first mission in the Gemini program, Gemini 3, alongside Gus Grissom. Smuggling a corned beef sandwich into space seems to have done little to hurt his career, since we soon saw him again as command pilot on Gemini 10, which set new altitude records, and as command module pilot on Apollo 10, which served as a dress rehearsal for the first landing. With this fourth flight, Young would tie the record set by Jim Lovell, and also become the first person to enter orbit around the moon twice. While Lovell had made a second trip to the moon on Apollo 13, he hadn't entered orbit. Bummer for Jim. But believe it or not, we still haven't seen the last of Young, as this is his fourth of six flights. Joining him as command module pilot was Ken Mattingly. While he hasn't flown yet, we know Mattingly from episode 42, which began our coverage on Apollo 13. Mattingly, in a fairly well-known story at this point, was pulled from the Apollo 13 crew at practically the last possible moment, due to a concern that he would come down with the measles while in lunar orbit. <laughs> 
It was a controversial choice then and now, but when the backup lunar module pilot Charlie Duke got sick and NASA realized Mattingly was not immune, they felt there wasn't really much of a choice. He never did get the measles, which I imagine had to make the whole thing even worse. At least if he got the measles, he would know it was the right call to pull him from the flight. Anyway, we discussed his background in episode 42, so if you want to learn more, head back for a quick re-listen. This was his first of three flights. And taking that last seat was Lunar Module Pilot Charlie Duke. Wait, the Charlie Duke that was supposed to have gotten Ken Mattingly sick? Yep, that Charlie Duke. Maybe he just wanted Ken as a buddy in Apollo 16. Charles Duke Jr. was born on October 3, 1935, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Duke attended the U.S. Naval Academy, picking up a bachelor's degree in, surprise surprise, naval sciences. He then joined the Air Force and bounced around the world for a few years, serving in a variety of roles, including as an interceptor fighter pilot in West Germany. Somewhere along the way there, he attended MIT, since he emerged in 1964 with a master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics. He attended the Aerospace Research Pilot School and stuck around to become an instructor. And that's where NASA found him when they came calling in 1966. He joined as one of the 19 guys in Astronaut Group 5 and had been waiting for his chance to fly ever since. Fun fact, it was Charlie Duke in the Capcom chair during the Apollo 11 landing and the first steps, so he is the voice of Houston you hear during those dramatic moments. This was his first and only spaceflight. On April 16, 1972, at 12.54pm, Young, Mattingly, and Duke were pressed back into their seats as their Saturn V began the 12-minute long ride uphill to orbit. And if you're looking for some space trivia, and really who isn't, this was the last time humans launched on a Saturn V in daylight, since Apollo 17 would be the launch vehicle's first and only night launch. The launch itself went smoothly, but during their stay in low Earth parking orbit, a problem developed with the S-4B third stage. The third stage is an unusual part of the launch vehicle. While the first and second stages only had to perform for a few minutes, the S-4B had to stay healthy and do its job for several hours, as the crew checked their equipment before committing to flying to the moon. From the ground, it looked like the third stage was leaking helium and nitrogen, which could cause its attitude control system to fail in a few hours. Thankfully, they only needed attitude control for the few minutes of the TLI burn, so if it failed, the reaction control system on the service module should be able to bridge the gap. For the eighth time, an S-4B did its thing and sent three men hurtling towards the moon. The CSM, dubbed Casper, popped off the top of the S-4B, turned around, and grabbed the LEM, dubbed Orion, with no difficulty. There was some momentary concern when the crew noticed a number of particles shedding off of the LEM. Was the thermal insulation disintegrating? Had the hull been breached? Nah, it was just another instance of the space environment being weird. It turns out that some of the paint used on the lunar module was prone to flaking when it got cold enough, which in this case was around 120 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. That's pretty cold. With Casper and Orion safely on their way, the S-4B was no longer needed, and sure enough, later on its attitude control system would fail, preventing the precise control necessary to steer it towards the seismometers left on the lunar surface by previous missions. It still hit the moon a few days later, but since it was just a dead chunk of metal by then, it was difficult to be sure precisely where and when, which added a fair amount of guesswork to interpreting the resulting vibrations. Among other things, one of the activities performed on the way out to the moon was the second iteration of an experiment I failed to mention last time. It turns out that for some time now, the astronauts had been experiencing something strange. Flashing lights. This wasn't some alien craft trying to signal them from outside the window, I'm not authorized to talk about that, but rather flashes that seemed to just spontaneously occur within the astronauts' eyes themselves. As you can imagine, it took some time for stories of these seemingly sourceless flashes to work their way back to NASA doctors. With basically all of the astronauts being test pilots these days, there was already a pretty deep-seated distrust of the men and women working to keep them healthy. Because if you could be pronounced fit to fly, you could also be pronounced unfit to fly. Just look at Alan Shepard and Deke Slayton. 
flashing in your eyes isn't normal, and maybe it indicated a problem, so best not talk about it. But eventually, the truth emerged, so it was time to get to the bottom of it. In order to remove some variables, the crew wore what were basically sleeping masks to cover their eyes, and spent an hour waiting to see flashes, calling them out whenever they saw one. It turns out that this unusual phenomenon was caused by errant high-energy particles whizzing through space, known as cosmic rays, slamming directly into the astronauts' retinas. The impact would cause a brief release of energy, which would be seen as a bright flash to the astronaut in question. We don't see these here on the Earth since the thick atmosphere makes it pretty unlikely a cosmic ray can survive the journey all the way down to the surface. Most of them hit some hapless nitrogen atom or something and explode into a bunch of pieces. Taking this experiment one step further from the previous mission, in addition to the sleeping mask, some crew members also placed a special plate over their eyes, which would capture the trail of the incoming particles. Perhaps most strangely of all, CMP Ken Mattingly reported no flashes at all, even as his crewmates were reporting several a minute. Maybe he can tell us something about that alien craft trying to signal them from outside the window. These cosmic rays actually pose a pretty significant problem for computers in space. When a high-energy particle hits a human's retina, they see a flash. But if it hits a computer's memory chip, the brief flash of energy can flip a zero to a one, or vice versa. This may not sound like that big of a deal, but remember that a computer is basically just a rock that we tricked into thinking. There's no way for it to know that a particular one was supposed to be a zero. Special precautions need to be taken to handle these single-event upsets, as they're known. One other sort of funny experiment I'll only mention in passing is a special rock brought on the journey to see if its magnetic properties changed when it arrived at the moon. What was so special about this rock? It was originally from the moon! It was picked up nearly three years earlier on Apollo 12. That's a pretty high-mileage rock. 74 and a half hours into the mission, the right sequence of valves opened in the service module, and hypergolic fuels rushed into the SPS combustion chamber, slowing Casper and Orion into their initial lunar orbit. Upon emerging around the front side of the moon again, John Young reported it as a, quote, super double fantastic burn, which sounds pretty good. Two revolutions later, Casper again fired up the SPS to drop them into the descent orbit, making the job of landing a little easier for Orion. The next day, Young and Duke floated across the docking tunnel and into Orion to make the preparations for a descent. As usual, a few problems were discovered, as they always are. The LEM has two antenna systems, omnidirectional and high gain. The high gain allowed significantly better signal quality and data rates, but needed to be pointed directly at the Earth. The omni antenna did not require any special orientation, but was not nearly as good of a signal. You may recall how on Apollo 11, they experienced difficulty with the high-gain antenna as it kept trying to point through the RCS plume deflectors. This analogy isn't perfect, but you can sort of compare the high-gain and omni antennas to a laser beam and a light bulb, respectively. Well, it seemed Orion would be depending on its omni antenna since, for whatever reason, the high-gain was refusing to yaw, which made it impossible to point to Earth. Next, pressure in one of the two propellant systems for the reaction control system began to rise. The helium used to pressurize the propellants was leaking. Left unchecked, this would cause the system to fail, making attitude control for the LEM impossible. But they didn't really need to fix this thing forever, just for the next couple of hours while they pulled off the landing. While the leak in the RCS system couldn't be stopped, the extra helium could be shunted into the ascent engine system. Nice try, Murphy's Law, but this spaceship is landing on the moon. 96 hours after lifting off from Florida, Orion and Casper separated. As they passed behind the moon, Mattingly prepared to do some last-minute engine checks before Young and Duke began power descent. When they emerged from behind the moon's eastern limb again, the news wasn't good. The big SPS engine was designed to gimbal, essentially allowing it to point in a slightly different direction. This allowed it to adjust the thrust vector and respond to any imperfections in the center of gravity caused by sloshing fuel, vehicle asymmetries, or moving astronauts. To do this, it had a series of servo motors that would allow it to pitch, which again you can think of as a nod-your-head-yes motion, or yaw, a shake-your-head-no motion. 
This was a critical capability that absolutely had to work, so of course there was a backup. As part of his checks in preparation for the orbit circularization burn, Mattingly put the primary and backup gimbals through their paces, making sure that the engine could point where it needed to. When he went to test the backup yaw gimbal, the whole vehicle started to shudder and oscillate. Whoa, not good. This actually wasn't necessarily a problem. It was possible that the engine was still controllable even if it was oscillating and making a big fuss. Plus, this was all in the backup system. The primary system had been just fine. But if it turned out that the SPS was inoperable, even the backup system, then the lunar landing would have to be called off. It was just too risky. Andrew Chaikin's excellent book, A Man on the Moon, has a great recounting of this story by Mattingly himself. In it, he says that Mattingly was sure the landing would be called off. He suspected that he knew what was causing the issue. In the past, some of the control cables that relayed the signal to the SPS engine were slightly too short. With a sufficiently aggressive gimbal, the cable could be pulled partially loose, leading to an inconsistent electronic connection. There was no way to fix this in orbit. Worse, he knew that the backup and primary systems shared a cable, so if the backup system was partially pulled out, there was a decent chance the primary was as well. But he kept that to himself. The engineers on the ground surely knew it anyway, so why add to the mounting anxiety? In Houston, frantic calls were made, telemetry plots were dragged out, and engineers got to work analyzing the problem. Was the backup gimbal system safe to rely on? While they figured that out, Orion re-rendezvoused with Casper, though they didn't dock, and all three men waited for a resolution. The clock was ticking. Lunar landings were chosen with specific times to ensure ideal landing conditions, and certain experiments had to happen on a schedule. Every minute spent in lunar orbit was a precious minute of surface time gone. Meanwhile, Orion's RCS continued to leak, requiring them to periodically shunt excess helium into the ascent engine system, for a total of four times. The clock was not in their favor. After three long revolutions around the moon, the answer from Houston arrived. Go for landing. All right. Mattingly was surprised, but also relieved that his spacecraft wasn't going to cost his crew the moon. According to Chaikin, when Mattingly returned home, he talked to Jim McDivitt, who had switched roles from astronaut to Apollo manager, about the decision to approve the landing. He said he was surprised that they decided to go for it, since he figured the fact that the two systems shared a cable would be enough to rule it out. McDivitt's response was that they didn't know they shared a system, and Mattingly was right, they would have called off the landing. Whether this is a lesson in don't assume decision makers have all the information, or keep your mouth shut and maybe it'll work out anyway, <laughs> I'm not sure, I'll leave it to you to judge. Young and Duke received some slightly updated information from the ground to account for their shifted orbit. This was due to the moon rotating a little underneath them, the effect of mass concentrations tugging on their orbit, and the occasional RCS firing required to prevent the system from overpressurizing. Five hours and 42 minutes later than planned, Orion's DPS engine throttled up and powered descent was underway. Twelve short minutes later, the call came from the crew. Well... We don't have to walk far to pick up rocks. The next morning, John Young crawled down the ladder, stepped off the Lem footpad, and said, There you are, mysterious and unknown Descartes, Highland Plains. Apollo 16 is going to change your image. Next time, we'll find out just how right Young was as we go on the hunt for volcanic rock. The geologists on Earth have bet big on this landing site, and while they're pretty confident in their theory of Descartes' formations, nothing beats hard evidence. And speaking of science, we'll also learn a little bit about the effects of large quantities of orange juice on the gastrointestinal tract of an Apollo astronaut. Oh, and John, try to watch your footing near the science experiments. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. <laughs> <laughs>